Alrighty, are we, we're streaming live, Janice? You are. Great. Well, I will get started because last time um, there were so many questions and uh, we didn't want to leave at 5.30. So I'm going to get going and then folks can uh, enter as they arrive. So welcome and thanks for um, joining us. For anyone who doesn't know me yet, my name is Maggie. I'm a scientist at FB Environmental and we are helping the Magundacook River Citizens Advisory Committee with um, their charge to engage the community in exploring resiliency outcomes for the Magundacook River. So this is our second presentation in this monthly series of um, virtual presentations held on the third Tuesday of each month. Our hope is that each of these will focus on a different aspect of the river and help both the committee and the public better understand future management options for the river. So our presentation today will be given by Nate Gray. Um, Nate is sharing the screen right now. He is a scientist with the Ma main department of marine resources uh, within the Sea Run Fisheries and Habitat Group. So welcome, Nate. Thanks for joining us. Um, Nate has been working on the Kennebunk River Basin since 1992 and works actively on river herring restoration projects um, across the state, as well as other diadromous species. Um, noteworthy is that Nate witnessed the removal of the Edwards Dam in Augusta in 1999 and has since seen populations of river herring rise from a rem remnant to over 5 million with the installation of multiple fish passage dam removal and the opening of thousands of acres of historical habitat in the drainage area. So just a reminder of some housekeeping rules. We'll begin with a 20 minute introductory presentation by Nate. This will be followed by an opportunity for the committee to ask questions and then we'll take questions from the public. The presentation will be kept to an hour, the webinar. So we will end at 5.30 no matter what. The committee members are all elevated as panelists here. And after the presentation, they'll be given an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, when you do that, please use the raised hand feature, or if you'd prefer to submit your question through the Q&A, that's fine. You can also do it anonymously. Um, please keep your microphones muted if you're a panelist, unless you're actively speaking. And then following um, the committee questions, we will move to the Q&A where we can take questions from the public. If we don't have time to get through all of those, we will record them and we will work with Nate to, to try to answer those and um, post them on the town website. And uh, just so you all know, you can see in the corner there, but the presentation is live streamed to the town YouTube page. So uh, this is live and it will also be available for you to go back and listen to. So with that, it looks like we have 10 panelists and six attendees. I will turn it over to Nate so I don't eat too much time. So thanks again, Nate. Well, thank you, Maggie. That was a great introduction. Uh, again, I'm Nate Gray with Marine Resources. Uh, this May will be my beginning of my 32nd year before the mast, as they say. I've been working on river herring restoration as well as a multitude of other diadromous species. Uh, since I started my career with marine resources. Prior to that, I had worked for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game out of the Cordova office and the Seward office, uh, working on uh, bag return uh, salmon uh, in the Pacific fisheries. I got actively recruited uh, to DMR, uh, basically right out of school. And I've been doing this ever since. And it's a pleasure to be speaking to you all tonight. We're going to go over some river herring ecology. And the reason we're going to kind of focus on these fish is when it comes to the McGunticook uh, drainage and McGunticook Lake proper, these are the two principal drivers uh, in that system. Uh, the river herring uh, is basically a collective term used to describe two separate species of fish, the blueback herring, and which is on the bottom of the screen there. And it's slightly larger and a uh, very similar cousin, the alewife. The alewives like ponded habitat and the bluebacks like stream habitat to spawn in. Uh, and that's not to say that any sort of restoration work on the McGunticook would be limited to these two species. Multiple other species would also benefit. And we'll get into that in a second. Uh, we're just gonna go through some basic background life history. We'll move on to the next slide uh, here if I can. Come on slide. 
Well, it worked before. Is it moving on your page? Or nope. No? I got nothing. <laughs> Isn't that magical? Oh, there we go. It worked. I think. Yeah, it's working. Okay. Um, the screen is important. Uh, as boring as it looks, uh, it comes from NOAA and it shows the extent of these two species on the eastern seaboard. As you can see, the ill life extends down into the Carolinas, uh, into Georgia, um, and the blueback herring extends down into Florida. What it doesn't show you is both these species also uh, continue well up into the Canadian Maritimes on both maps. Uh, interestingly, uh, we know through historical landings uh, that both these populations of fish, collectively river herring, have been basically driven uh, down about 96% from their historical, uh, what we know were historical highs. Uh, post-contact, of course, colonial contact, but they essentially existed in about every coastal river system and lake system that had uh, access to it, natural access to it, didn't have falls. Um, that this species, both these species were spread up and down the Eastern seaboard in great numbers. They're highly fecund. Uh, females carry about 100,000 eggs each. It makes the math a lot easier when you're talking about recruitment uh, in the future. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. Uh, so that's the distribution on the Eastern seaboard. That's where these fish are native to. Um, we had landlocked populations uh, that were introduced into several places that they shouldn't ought to been as a bait fish. Uh, and subsequently the anadromous form uh, through the digging of the Erie Canal made it up into the Great Lakes, which also wasn't really the best of things to have happen. Uh, onto the next slide, ill life life cycle. Uh, basically you can add this to all your anadromous species here on the Eastern seaboard. Uh, unlike the Pacific species, they don't die after they spawn. They can spawn multiple times. Typical sexual maturity is at four years old um, for both male and female as first time novel spawners. This is principally a marine species, okay, but it has to spawn in freshwater. But it spends a, a short bit of its life, about oh, three to five months in freshwater, uh, maturing enough to basically drop out to sea to live for another four years before it's sexually mature and it returns to its natal waters where it was born, typically speaking. There is some stray component, i.e. fish that seek out novel waters, which is actually a really cool thing. Stray seems to have a negative connotation, but in reality, if straying didn't occur amongst these anadromous populations, not just river herring, but you know the multiple other ones, stripers and, and salmon and sturgeon and shad, there'd only be one river on planet Earth with this one species and another one with another species. So this straying component, which rates anywhere from 2% of the population to maybe as, half, as high as 25%, 30% driven by uh, abiotic factors in the system, uh, like beaver dams, they might stray someplace else to try to spawn, uh, really is their saving grace. Uh, going back to the introduction, I worked extensively on the Kennebec and what we had in the Kennebec was a vestigial population, a remnant population uh, that had once numbered millions upon millions and had been reduced through the triple three, you know, the overfishing, the pollution and the installation of dams and loss of habitat to roughly about 100,000 fish, best we could guess. And we could capture about 60,000 of those fish in a season working from June into July and truck them into historical habitat while we worked on trying to secure fish passage. Uh, to reestablish the populations and get them running again. Um, and we literally did see it go from, from just that, you know, that remnant population to, well, the high count at Benton Falls on the Sebastocook, which is the lowest most dam on the Sebastocook currently, uh, 5.7 million uh, of a peak run. So adults come in and spawn. Uh, they immediately try to leave after spawning, head back to the ocean. The eggs hatch out in a relatively short period of time in the water. Uh, interestingly, these fish are strictly uh, planktivores. Uh, they eat zooplankton, uh, which is one step up from phytoplankton. 
uh, the absolute base of the food chain as a primary producer. Uh, and so the juveniles feed on the zooplankton population and grow to be bigger juveniles and they metamorphose after about 30 days and take on their adult form. At this point, they can swim pretty good and they're kind of self-determined. Uh, prior to that, they're what we term as ichthyoplankton. They're so small, you can hardly see them, basically a thread with eyeballs and fins on it. Um, and come fall time, light starts to decline, you know, primary and secondary production begin to decline in the pond and it triggers a response in the fish and they drop out to the ocean, gone for four years, come back on that fourth spring. Um, and it really is kind of remarkable. Uh, and the multiple projects we've worked on here, it's kind of like magic, how well it works, uh, getting these fish, once you get habitat open back up again, uh, they really, do respond quite well to that, as you can imagine. Uh, this is some boilerplate from the state, just to give you an idea of why we do what we do. Uh, the Kennebec uh, Hydro Restoration, or KHDG, Kennebec Hydro Developers Group, was a, uh, an agreement between the hydro interests on the Kennebec River uh, that essentially put money into a pot uh, to delay the installation of fish passage, which can be very expensive. Uh, so that we could trap and truck. Uh, the two objectives there, to achieve an annual production of 6 million alewives above Augusta, we've done that. Uh, and to achieve an annual production of, you know, 700, 725,000 shad, I leave this in here because American shad, which is the largest river herring or herring species on the planet, also anadromous, has to spawn in fresh water. Uh, they get much, much larger than alewives. Uh, I can't tell you how many shad are in the Kennebec right now. I know the population is significant, but to anybody that's worked with shad, uh, when you try tagging a shad or doing some sort of mark recapture study on shad, they're very, very difficult to work with, particularly when they're grabbing, particularly when they're in the fresh water. And just about every study that you do gets blown out because you tag the shad and they just disappear. They never come back again. Um, but I do know anecdotally that the, the uh, recreational fishery for shad on the Kennebec is essentially second to none on the Eastern seaboard. Um, and that's saying something because we had a shad hatchery program that ran for uh, 11 years out of Walderboro, just down the pike from you guys a little bit. And we really became cutting edge in the uh, shad uh, rearing um, uh, frontier, uh, both for interstate and federal agencies were in, in the end coming to Maine to ask how we did so good with so few broodstock. And indeed we did get that good. We learned an awful lot about the species. Um, this isn't a digression, it's, it's just telling you, you know, how we got where we are today uh, and I can pretty much guarantee you the shad population in the Kennebec is well above 100,000, but we're above 100,000 based on habitat units. And I have no clue because in order to figure it out, I got to catch them. And then to catch them, I got to kill half of them because that's about what happens to shad when you try to do mark recapture studies. So I'll take the anecdotal evidence any day over a mark recapture study for American shad. Uh, by the way, American shad are very good to eat. This is a pitch for fishing in the Kennebec. Uh, they, they really are outstanding uh, smoke. Um, and so are alewives and bluebacks for that matter. Uh, good food. This is basically it. And this is kind of more boilerplate. This is the greater Kennebec basin and the historical uh, waters and the upper reaches of the Kennebec. And you can see the blue ones are the ones that we're in right now. There's one red one in the lower center of your stream stream called China Lake, which we just, just finished doing passage on. Um, it was a very, very long-term project. Uh, and you kind of have to look at these projects that way. There's, I haven't seen a sprint in the bunch. They're all marathons. Uh, China Lake, I started doing public outreach in 2001. Um, and we really started uh, going at it hammer and tongs with uh, Main Rivers, which is a great group that I work with, Landis Hudson. Uh, Matt Streeter, um, and we just completed uh, the China Lake project, uh, full open system, uh, 2022 for the first time since 1783. 
Uh, the response was instantaneous. We had already stocked the pond for uh, since 2014. And this year I did a count into uh, China Lake and I was up over 837,000 fish in about a six week window, um, which was just remarkable how fast the response was um, from, from that restoration. Uh, I also did the Weber Pond Project and the Three Mile Pond Project. Um, reestablishing connectivity with those. And essentially the center of that map where you see the Sebastocook and Shawmut Dam and peel off there, um, that is the site of probably, if not the largest uh, bald eagle aggregation east of the Mississippi now, uh, come springtime because they all show up to feed their kids on river herring. Uh, and we did a flush count with a helicopter and just on outlet stream from China Lake, uh, we flushed well north of a, a hundred uh, bald eagles, both adults and juveniles, in just that seven and a half miles. Um, it's really remarkable how quickly the wildlife kind of keys in on where the food is coming from and they start utilizing it. Uh, next. <clears throat> Remember, part of this talk is about ecology, and this is really interesting. Uh, I was asked to give a five minute presentation to the science group in house to just kind of explain who we were uh, to the other groups within marine resources. And so I was given five minutes to put this presentation out to the group. And so I kept it really simple. And I use this one definition, ecology, because when people think about ecology, they kind of get glazed over and they don't really think about the word that much, but and what it actually means. And functionally, I'm a trained ecologist. That's what I went to school for. When you look at it, oikos and, and uh, you know, ology, the, the study of the house, that's everything all together, both biotic and abiotic components working together um, to form these populations of organisms. Um, in, there's a lot to it. Ecology is extraordinarily complex. Um, and when you really start digging down, the more you dig down, the more complex you realize it is. Uh, in short, what I'm telling you is as smart as you think you are, the more you dig into it, you realize you're just getting dumber by the second because um, it really is that complex. Uh, and I have a couple slides here uh, later on uh, that kind of show you the difference between simple ecosystems and very complex ecosystems. Um, and I have a, a kind of a, a energy flow diagram in here too, which we'll get to in a moment and I'll step right up because here we go. Uh, the next one, keystone species, which is what we're talking about here in the form of river herring, they are indeed a keystone species. Uh, that last yellow sentence, uh, without keystone species, the, the ecosystem that you're currently living in uh, will be dramatically different or cease to exist altogether. And there's a lot of truth to that. In fact, it is the truth. Um, these keystone species are prime drivers of everything that happens around them, even in the off season when the fish aren't present because they change behaviors. Uh, in their absence, they change behaviors. Um, when we look at near cod sp spawning stocks, what we found out is when the river herring away, went away and we were also fishing on the cod spawning stocks, uh, so did they go away because they were relying on those river herring showing up in the early spring right after they spawned uh, to refill their larders, as it were, get fat again, be strong big cod again, and that stopped happening. Virtually up and down the eastern seaboard, especially in extent where the cod were. So simple ecosystems. Here's one now. Uh, we all know what that is, and it is indeed a simple ecosystem. It has one function to get you from point A to point B without killing you. Okay. And a lot of times when you're looking at something this complex, and we have design drawings for every aspect of that airplane, 250 miles of wiring, 100,000 pounds of fuel, 30,000 feet, traveling at 540 knots, what's the most important part of the ecosystem? And everybody can chime in. They can pick out things like the engines and like the tail and like the windows and the control surfaces and the cockpit and the pilot, very, very important person on the plane, the co-pilot, the navigation system, the GPS system, the air handling system, converting, you know, the 
stratospheric oxygen into oxygen you can actually breathe, all very important. And uh, when you get right down to it, <clears throat> on a Trans-Pacific flight from Los Angeles to Tokyo, suddenly the, uh, the uh, lavatory becomes extremely important. Uh, in fact, it becomes one of the most important components of the airplane, because without that, you'd wish you were dead by the time you got to Japan. Um, but indeed, this is a very simple ecosystem. Um, and when we look at natural ecosystems, what we find out is it makes this, there are no design drawings and they're extraordinarily complex and the wiring is infinite. The fuel is infinite. Uh, and how it behaves is really something. And we've only really just begun to understand ecosystems, even the most fundamental uh, components. Really, it's only been a modern uh, study, uh, a very important one that we've actually made inroads uh, just in the past hundred years, if that. A great book, if anybody wants to read it, Where the Wild Things Were, were by uh, uh, Bill Foltzhauser, I think. Where the Wild Things Were. It's a play on Maurice Sendak's thing. Look it up. It's a great book. It'll give you some idea about how ecosystems truly function. Another simple ecosystem, this is the International Space Station at 87 you know, miles above the planet. Uh, in fact, it's even more rarefied and even simpler than the 747. It appears more complex, but it's true one job is to keep you alive in orbit. Um, indeed, a, a simple ecosystem. To think you can reproduce that in a large enough form to support a human population in space, you start to understand how complex that really is to make enough food, to have enough resources available to you in this rarefied atmosphere uh, of no atmosphere. Uh, gives you some idea of how important the ecosystem that we currently exist in really is. And it's around you every day, and we all take it for granted up to the point where it starts to falter. Remember, I told you it wasn't going to be just about river herring. This is our current suite and our existing suite in extant. These are the fish that we had when we showed up as European colonists. The only one I didn't double down on was the Atlantic sturgeon, which isn't here because, well, it dwarfs the rest of them in its full maturity, but we have striped bass and shad and alewives and bluebacks and salmon and eels and smelt and tomcod and even the lowly lamprey, which everybody seems to hate, which is actually a really, really important component of the ecosystem in the stream environment. Uh, and of course, a short nosed sturgeon. We have 12 of them. And I haven't even included the sea run brook trout, which we do know exists down the Matagantica and would benefit greatly from some sort of restoration work there. So there you have the full suite uh, of fish, all interconnected. Okay. This screen is intentionally blank because we're going to go through a, a, a quick kind of process here where we're going to look at river herring, particularly let's take an alewife, and we're going to kind of build its world uh, and show you some of the connections that occur within this world, within the ecosystem the alewife inhabits, uh, both terrestrial and aquatic. Are you ready? Here we go. This would be your typical phytoplankton. This is your primary producer, which lives in the water. It's driven by sunlight. It's the only thing that can make its own food, essentially. That's what primary producer means. It uses chlorophyll. And then we have its apex predator, which would be zooplankton. In this case, a big Daphne and some other copepods swimming around. And they all go around either eating each other or principally eating the phytoplankton. And then we bring in the zooplankton. Okay, this is the apex predator of the zooplankton. This would be an alewife. Okay? And from here, things begin to rapidly spread out in our little model ecosystem here, which is really important to understand. And we're going to touch just on the tip of the iceberg. You ready? Follow along with the yellow lines. This is who eats who. And I'm burning right through this really quick because I know I only got 20 minutes, not quite as short or long as five minutes, but you get some idea of the complexity of how it works. See that freshwater clam in the lower left-hand side? Nobody thinks much about them. They're really critical to water quality, good population of freshwater clams, but freshwater mussels, I should say, they don't get around so well. So they use hosts, things like alewives and other fish species 
move around. In the case of the alewife floater, it's almost exclusive to the alewife. That's how they move around. You have a good, healthy population of freshwater mussels. They can clarify water at a tremendous rate. Um, and typically speaking, most of our populations now are highly fragmented. Their original host species are no longer present, um, yet they're really important to have. We'll keep going. Okay. So you can see we bounce back and forth. Yes, even black ducks eat alewives. This is a true story. They'll eat them like Doritos if they can find them in good numbers, and they do. In fact, black ducks figure it out. They figure out where the alewife choke points are, and they go there, and they hang out waiting for the juvenile alewives to drop out so they can eat like they're at the Dorito factory. Snakes indeed eat them too. Phosphorus, the prime driver. There you have it. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. You can see the songbird in the cup of, in the kind of center upper right. You know, it's a warbler. What happens is, is these alewives swim in and they increase the trophic state of the stream and it increases invertebrate production, i.e. insects. Now, anybody that's a birder knows that warblers love traveling along migratory corridors that involve water, streams and rivers, i.e. high bug production. Um, and indeed, you can see that here on the Sebastopol, where we have a fairly large warbler migration now that occurred previously. However, the numbers have gone up significantly since the dam has come out. Production has gone up, both in the presence of the alewives and in the shallowness of the water and its oxygenation, being able to support more macroinvertebrates, more bugs, more birds, more things that eat birds. Is everybody following along? All right. Principal problems with the restoration of these species. I'm just gonna be really brief. Here's a map of Maine. Those are the numbers of dams and extant that are actually on the catalog. There are multiple more than that that aren't on the catalog. Um, and what's not here is culverts, okay? If we were to put culverts on this map, the map would be virtually just about yellow. Okay. All of these can be passage uh, problems for these uh, highly migratory fish species, not just the river herring, but things like white sucker, which people don't think much about, but are actually really uh, important components of healthy ecosystems. Just the diversity aspect of it is you can't say enough about if you're just down to a few species of warm water fish, your diversity is basically floored and there's not going to be much happening there as a dynamic system. Okay. Uh, we'll get to the root cause of the declines of these fish. We've already covered it. That's us. Root cause of restoration. That's us too. Impediments to restoration. Guess what? That's us. Okay. Uh, typically speaking, we're our own best friend and our own worst enemy all in the same breath. Um, but restoration uh, is totally doable and it's totally worthwhile in the big picture, particularly for a diverse and healthy ecosystem which we all live in. By the way, did I tell you these fish taste actually really good, especially if you can them because they're bony, but it gets rid of all the bones. Um, and I told you, uh, where are we at on time? Anybody got a, a time index for me? Yeah, we're we're kind of, we're at time, so. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Thanks. Those are the responses from the Sebasta Cook. The rest of it, this is you. Uh, this is Maganta Cook uh, River Watershed and Lake. Based on the surface acreage and about 1,220 surface acres, you're looking at an annual return of just 100,000 uh, alewife, uh, plus significant stream habitat uh, for blueback herring and multiple other species, you know, benefits across the board. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's really remarkable. Um, and again, I appreciate you guys inviting me to speak. Um, yep, there's work to be done. Sounds good. So you'll you're gonna call it there then? Yep, I'll call it there. I mean, there's a bunch more, you know, just showing stuff that eats. Particularly, this one is really interesting. Uh, this is a harbor seal. I know you guys are very familiar with the harbor seal down in uh, Camden. What's fascinating about this harbor seal, and it's not the only one, it showed up in Waterville. 70 miles from the ocean, uh, following, guess what, river herring, <laughs> and uh, hung out there, and one in Benton Falls as well. Um, 
and this is just a you know a small selection of the stuff that will readily pound on the species we were just talking about um, when it's available. Um, so there you have it. And Thanks, Nate. Yeah, do you want to unshare your screen? Yeah, I'm going to hit that right now, and there we go. Awesome. Well, we'll give the committee a chance. Thank you so much. We'll give the committee a chance to ask any questions or if there's part of the last part um, of Nate's talk there that you want to elaborate on. Um, this is a good time. You can use the raised hand feature or you can drop your question in the Q&A. Oh, Susan, yes. You can unmute yourself and ask. Okay, I have two questions. Uh, one is when a river is restored or dams are taken down or fish ladders are put in, is there any additional restoration that needs to be done to the river? And uh, have you seen any changes in with climate change, like the temperature of the river and the and the species? That's a really good question, Susan. And the answer is uh, yes, to both. Um, uh, additional work is kind of a uh, that's a really broad uh, subject. Uh, you know, I. I and I, I'm, I get paid to do this, but I've been working on the Kennebec, quote unquote, in the Sebastopol Basin, uh, and there's always stuff to do. Um, you know, every time we go out in the field, we do a beach sanding uh, uh, series every year, a community assessment, and which is really important to do to kind of keep track of what's happening in the system. Uh, and that's not even the point I was trying to make. You know, one of the things we do is we, we you know, as a crew, when we're, when we're at one of the beach chain sites, we pick up trash along the river and clean it up. Uh, and the river has been and was a, you know, a massive dumping ground for material waste uh, because uh, that's what people did back in the day. Climate change is a really, really broad topic. And I can just tell you from, from, been doing this as long as I have, you know, and tracking the changes to river herring populations, not so much here in Maine, we're doing a really, really good job of restoration. We have the largest river herring reserves in extant on the planet remaining. Uh, and it, it's not by accident because we've been working on it for quite a long time. Uh, and some of the populations down south of us, particularly 2022, was an alarming year, both in its heat index, because we had one of the warmest summers on record. Uh, we saw, we're seeing, we're actively seeing the collapse of river herring runs to our south, uh, which is alarming. And we have a good idea of why some of it is happening. A lot of it is happening from commercial fisheries bycatch. Uh, which we have no control over. That's a whole separate entity with NOAA that rules the roost on, as far as commercial oceanic fisheries go and the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. And, you know, we're, we're, some of the managers down there are beside themselves because they, you know, there's, they're watching these runs that they've husbanded literally uh, over several decades suddenly tank and, and they think they know why. And they think it's commercial bycatch. Going back to the to the actual climate change aspect, of it, we're also seeing that in other species, like the decline of uh, rainbow smelt uh, from the south to the north, being driven by either warming temperatures or other uh, anthropogenic changes, like you know the contamination of uh, spawning grounds, uh, uh, historical spawning grounds. That the smelt spawn on and then the, the, the eggs become non-viable and that's that and you lose that population and it seems to be ticking its way slowly northward uh, towards us. Um, we're working as hard as we can to try to preserve the populations we have, not through the reduction of, of uh, fishing effort, which this year before the group got going, we saw um, uh, I asked them about you know smelt fishing and basically our our smelt camp survey this year didn't didn't occur because there wasn't enough ice to put a smelt camp on, uh, which is rather alarming. Being the warmest January on record uh, was that's sobering. Uh, there you have it. 
Yeah, okay. thanks, Nate. Um, so it looks like Sophie has her hand up. So Sophie, go ahead. Can't hear. I'm I'm here twice. Uh, my husband logged in as me as well, and I think he also has his hand up. Um, Nate, thank you so much for a great presentation. Once a river is restored, uh, I know it's it's a tricky question, but what is how long does it take for the fish to come back? Do we have to restock certain species? Um, do and how do we monitor it? And how often do you monitor the growth of the the fish population? I mean, I'm. My favorite slide in, in your presentation was who eats who, because I yeah. loved how you showed the interconnection between the microinvertebrate, the fish, the birds, and the whole ecosystem. Just completely love it. So, but how, how do we go about, you know, do we need to restock? How often do we monitor? What can we expect? Like, let's imagine that we restore the river, completely remove the dams. What could happen in the Meguntikuk? Thank well, you. And then... Uh, it, that's a that's a really good question, Sophie. And typically, what happens is uh, marine resources. We have a stocking program that we do, and the you know the the group can put in a request, um, and we'll pass it up the chain, as it were, because it's an inland water. So we'll talk to our sister agency over at IFW. Uh, I don't see any issues there, and we'll stock the pond. Okay, now. You could go about it with the method that you don't do any stocking and you allow natural expansion, i.e. that stray component that I mentioned, to colonize the pond. And I believe that would happen in relatively short order. Um, however, you can jumpstart a run by some targeted stocking. And we look at that Maganta Cook at roughly six per acre uh, as a potential uh, starting point for stocking. And we put in you know, uh, uh, 7,000 fish or so uh, for uh, uh, about a life cycle, about four years. And on that fourth year, uh, you know, barring some tremendous event, we should see a very, very positive response on recruitment, i.e. adults returning back to the McGuntacrick system to make it back into their natal waters, which of course would be McGuntacrick Lake because we stocked it. Um, that's that's typically how we've gone about it in the past uh, because it really jump starts to run. And as far as monitoring goes, and I can tell you this from a lot of experience actually doing monitoring work, uh, you know, we use electronic counters, uh, we use cameras, okay? But in my estimation, uh, there is nothing that beats a human being standing there with a counter in their hands counting. And the reason I say that is because that implies a level of ownership of the resource, um, which is really kind of important. This is your system. These are your resources that you know serve a critical ecological function and paying close attention to them uh, is really kind of important. And that human element uh, is, I've seen it again and again in the past, uh, you know, doing counts myself, timed counts, and we have a protocol for all that where you don't have to sit there all day long. You can count, you know, certain time windows. A lot of times you get approached by somebody and they'll ask you a question, and then you can do what I'm doing now. And you can tell them, and you might make an advocate. And a good, strong advocate in the future is a really important thing. It's kind of like kids in school, you know, you, you, develop this community around the resource that's that's willing to go to bat for it, much like you are now with the system as a whole, uh, which is critical to the overall future of that resource and its and its resiliency. Uh, you got to understand, you know, the, the system, the McGuntacook system got the way it is because it got the way it is. It was converted from a, you know, a natural system into a center of commerce. And you can essentially look at the state of Maine that story was repeated literally thousands of times, and you nearly have you nearly have to just look at a map of the state of Maine, take a Delorean Gazetteer, and look at every town, look at every town, and they all have one thing in common: they're all on water. Okay? And that water was a source of power, and that power was a source of commerce. Okay? It usually came at a pretty tremendous cost. We just don't think about it that way. Um, we think about it as you know we're you know we have a you know 
some sort of mill here that makes shingles, grinds grist, you know, makes whatever it happens to make. And, you know, I have several within a mile of my house. Uh, that's what they did. And, but subsequently, all those those other things that lived there got cut off from there because there was no provision for fish passage in any of these. In fact, all the laws that were on the books from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, guess what happened in 1820? They all got thrown out because now we were the state of Maine, you know. And by that time, a lot of these runs, these huge runs, like the Sebastopol, like the St. Croix, like the Penobscot, were mere foggy memories, if a memory at all, because several generations had passed before there had been any appreciable runs of fish that remained. Um, so that stewardship, that's the word, that stewardship is, is kind of an ongoing obligation for any of these runs. Uh, to ensure that they continue into the future. Um, All right, I think, um, I just wanna make sure everyone gets an opportunity here. Ray has his hand up. Yeah, go ahead, Ray. Ray. You'll need to unmute yourself, Ray. <laughs> or I can, hold on, there you go. You're on, oh, yeah. <laughs> we're competing, yeah. Oh, oh there, we go. Uh, okay. there we are. Am I on now? Okay. Uh, you're Nate. good. Okay. You and Nate. I were just competing with uh, hitting your mute right. button. Okay, Nate. The McGonagook obviously is a lot different from the Kennebec watershed. I mean, the McGonagook is only three miles long. It has a drop of 143 feet from the lake to the ocean. Yeah. Um, and we're going to have to have multiple fish ladders on the river uh, in several different places. What would you, what are your concerns about fish mortality and everything with that kind of a steep rise and with ex with fish ladders in that uh, short of span. I can speak to that uh, with a great level of accuracy. The China Lake system isn't that different. Uh, the stream was mm -hmm. about twice as long, but we had to overcome uh, six obstacles of the original 14. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, to get up into the system. So the combination, and to back up a little bit, the fish passage engineers that are in extant today uh, are the result of previous fish passage engineers. There's been a whole bunch of advances in both understanding how the fish behave and in the hydraulic capacities of the fish passages to make them uh, a lot more efficient than they had been in the past. In the past, it was kind of a piecemeal kind of thing, um, you know, make it work. Kind of thing. They're all they're you know the some of the, my partners at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. There's an enormous wealth of uh, knowledge there. And the fish passages we put it on the China Lake system were all sized appropriately for the run. They were placed appropriately because uh, we did a lot of studies. We looked at the the system as much as they would look at your system on the Magenta Cook. Trust me mm -hmm. to to build the best possible alternative. Uh, to a dam removal in the form of fish passage, if the you know a particular dam stays or whatnot, uh, it's quite good. Uh, mortality, even in an open system, there is some mortality and it varies. Uh, the beauty of the McGuntercook system is it's right there on the ocean, so the transition, you know, the, the migration for let's say an alewife into the system is three and a half miles in and three and a half miles out. It greatly increases the probability of survival the less energy you have to spend getting where you're going. Because remember, when they come into the fresh water, they're pretty much not eating. Uh, they're getting ready to go to prom night. And nobody's interested in food on prom night. So they come in to, to reproduce. As soon as they're done with that, it usually takes about oh, 10 days, two weeks for uh, the females to get done expressing their eggs once they hit the pond system. They immediately want to boogie back out of the system and get back to the ocean, which is their true home. And then the kids subsequently will hang out for, like I said, three to five months, depending on, you know, uh, the abiotic conditions, mostly precipitation and, and primary production and water availability before they try to head back out to the ocean for their four year uh, journey. Uh, which interestingly, it, it bears saying, you know, everybody asks when the alewife run starts and everybody says, oh, around about April, May. Well, in reality, the alewife run starts about September, October, you know, when the juveniles leave, because that's the start. 
chicken and the egg kind of thing, but I like to look at it that way. And it helps people understand that connected nature of the anadromous fish and the freshwater environment from its marine environment and everything that happens in between. Good. Magantacook is well positioned to have fairly little mort mortality, uh, barring some unfortunate event because of its proximity to the ocean, quick in and out. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Nate. Um, any other questions from committee members before I take some of the public questions? We have a couple. No, okay. So we have two questions related to historic runs on the McGunticook um, that they're very similar. So I don't know if you, Nate, or um, anyone else suggested Wabanaki tribal members or members of the MRCAC might be able to tell us what species have historically been in the McGunticook and, and um, specifically one person asks about historic runs of river herring and sea run brook trout and that they've heard both yes and no on that subject. Yeah, it's a, that's a really, really good question. And typically speaking, we don't try to restore runs where they didn't occur historically, okay? And we're pretty sure there was one there, but because the, the Bagantikok was so heavily developed so early on, um, it, you know, I'm pretty sure there's historical record of alewives having been in that system. Uh, and certainly multitudes of other species as well, like eels in particular. I'm almost certain that the enti entire upper, upper system is depauperate of eels because they simply can't get past all the blockages in the green. As far as I understand it, alewives were present there and sea run brook trout. Uh, it has all the hallmarks. Uh, and I can't remember who I was talking to, but they were absolutely certain. Uh, that alewives had made it up into the system. But again, you know, the full development of the McGuntacook system happened very, very early on in the colonial period uh, with multitudes of dams. Everybody was fighting to get a dam in there because it was horsepower, you know. Thanks, Nate. Um, and then another question here. Someone who was a kid 45 years ago used to catch eels in the McGuntacook Reservoir, just wondering how they could have gotten there. Ah. This is a great question. It's something I can speak to. <clears throat> of all the fish I deal with, those 12 species that I mentioned, the eel is the only one that when you look at it, it looks back. Uh, eels are extraordinarily long lived uh, of all those species. It's, they're only uh, second to the sturgeons in their potential lifespan. Uh, typical average age of a female in the McGuntacook system when she takes off to the ocean uh, is probably upwards of 20 years old. Okay? And it's a one-shot wonder. Uh, and we've all heard the stories about eels crawling over land to get into water bodies, and that's absolutely true. However, it is not a preference. Okay? Eels will do this behavior because they're capable of doing this behavior. Okay? They're very, very good climbers. And so they can climb over things like dams, provided there's a wetted surface and the angle isn't, you know, vertical. Uh, and even vertical, they'll, they'll attempt it. Uh, and it's interesting that you said 45 years ago, you know, if we were to take a thousand eels and put them down at the base of the McGunticook system in Camden Harbor and magically be able to track them as good as a fishery scientist as I am, it's very, very difficult to do. Um, how many of them would make it into the McGunticook in its current condition? And my guess is you would be lucky to see a tenth of an eel make it in. Now, when we look at the fishery that occurs for glass eels and understanding that a pound of eels is roughly two, you know, uh, is 2,000 individuals, uh, it takes a lot of eels, a lot of effort in order for just one to make it into the lake to grow up to be a mature eel. Typically what we find behaviorally with eels is because they're essentially asexual until they get ready to go do the whole quantum sargasso thing. And oh, and it bears saying here, and because we got time to talk about it, of the diadromous species, eels is the only catadromous species. And cata comes from the Greek, it means down, under. Okay. And they have the exact opposite life cycle of the anadromous species, i.e., spawn in fresh water, grow up in the ocean. The eel spawns in the ocean, grows up in fresh water. So those eels that they were catching, you know, 45 years ago, are 
you know, the extremely lucky eels that managed to figure out a way to get past all those obstacles and not get pegged while they were doing it. Because you got to remember, they don't exist in a vacuum. Just about every piscivore that lives out there, fish that eat other fish, birds that eat fish, are laying in wait for that eel to make its move to come out of the water. You know, and they're very, very clever about how they do it. And I, I can, you know, I've seen starlings go after juvenile eels. I mean, everything will will chase after an eel. So the mere fact that they're making it up in there gives you some indication of how clever they are and how broad spectrum they are. They're the, probably the toughest fish that we have. They can live in everything from a five gallon pail of mud to a great lake, um, you know, provided they can actually get there. And that's the trick. Uh, is getting there. And so that answer is, 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 is they managed to squeak by all those dams and crawl up over all those dams in the dark of night, because that's typically when they like to move, cover darkness and uh, make it into the pond. And it's literally, you know, one in 10,000 would make it, uh, that, that made the effort. Um, they really are. I can't say enough about eels. Don't get me started. They're really a remarkable creature. And when they reach full maturity and a big, big adult female eel that's three feet long and weighs five and a half pounds, that's a remarkable creature. It has seen a lot in its life and they learn. In fact, I'll just give you a quick anecdote. This is how fast they learn. When I was first working on Weber Pond and I was doing bio samples below the dam at Weber Pond, i.e. catching juvenile alewives and measuring how their growth rate and everything you know, how fast they grew and, you know, and it's hard on them measuring 50, you know, alewives. And so as juveniles, in fact, it's almost fatal a hundred percent by the time you get them in a bucket full of water and you fish one out and measure it and put it in the water, it's kind of not doing too good. And so I was sitting below the, the dam in the stream measuring up my, my alewives and it wasn't too terrible long. And I saw an eel approach me. And this is an absolute true story. So that eel came right up to me. It was about 12 inches long. And so I had a dead alewife on my fingers and I stuck it under the water and the eel immediately saw the alewife, immediately knew what the alewife was. And within five minutes, it had come right up to my fingers and taken the alewife. And so I put another eel, uh, alewife in the water and that same eel came back. The long and the short of it is over the course of the entire sampling season, I had sat below that dam perhaps 10 times. And by the end of it, as soon as they saw my boots hit the water, about 25 eels would come running from all over the pool to sit at my feet like Pavlov's dog and get fed alewives. And strangely enough, to give you some idea of the whole level of intelligence there, if your boots were different than mine, they would not do that. Okay. They would wait to see. Okay. So they recognize an individual both behaviorally and physically. Uh, they're a remarkable creature. And at, you know, main second most valuable fishery, if you can imagine such a thing in today's day and age, is guess what? The American eel. You know, at roughly a dollar a piece, 19 million of them. Okay. Also amazing is if you look at the American eel as just a, a study, a desktop study, that 19 million, uh, you know, 9,000 pounds, 18 million, 18 million, 9,000 pounds, that's our allotment from the ASMFC to fish for glass eels. Yeah, I Every think that same person asked that question said that the eels are still trying to get up the river. Oh, yes, they are. Yep. And uh, strangely enough, they're, they're not homing. Okay? They just randomly take left-hand turns out of the Gulf Stream after they turn into their glass form, okay, their glass eel form from the leptocephalia, they kind of look like a willow leaf with eyeballs on it, little tiny thing. And they turn into a glass eel and they take a left-hand turn out of the Gulf Stream and just pick one, you know? And so we uh, have another question here. Um, yeah. I think this one might be a little bit challenging. I'm not sure what, um, so the question is what percent of herring or sea run brook trout would make it from Cam Camden Harbor through dams and fish passage to McGonticook Lake in a typical year, but I don't know what combination of dams and fish ladders this person's proposing. So I guess if you could maybe speak to the 
kind of yeah. the the efficacy of that. Fish of passage fish. efficiency plays a huge role, and I indicated earlier we've gotten a lot better at, at sighting fishways, designing fishways, operating fishways, which, by the way, we give lots of training for. Um, because it's no small thing. Fishways, you know, require some some maintenance, some upkeep, and some operations in the springtime uh, to ensure that they're functioning properly. And if we looked at it from the standpoint of, uh, you know, that that three hundred thousand fish that I indicated in the slide, and we were going to look at, you know, ninety five percent passage efficiency, we can sit down and do the math, you know, at the first dam, and it would, you know, it would give us. Uh, some indication of what the final run would be into the pond, uh, you know, through the loss at each dam uh, times 0.05, you know, we'd lose at the first dam, we'd lose 15,000 fish. Uh, so we'd start with, you know, 285 at the next dam and you'd lose, you know, 5% of that, okay? And at the next dam, we'd lose 5% of that and the cumulative impact would probably be down to, you know, 250,000 fish would make it into the lake. Um, through the loss of uh, uh, passage efficiency. But again, we've gotten much, much better at citing these uh, fish passages. And uh, so there you have it. Great. Um, we have three minutes left. Ray, it looks like you have another question. Oh, you have done mute. Okay. Uh, just a quick question, maybe a long answer. I don't know. Um, what when you're going uh, to introduce alewives or try to get them up to like China Lake or some other place like that? What regulatory hurdles or municipal uh, organizations or whatever do you have to get approval from to do it? Well, Raymond, here's the very simple answer: all of them. <laughs> we do a lot of public outreach um, and it's critical because, you know, uh, I'm a scientist by, you know, state moniker, right? But, but I prefer a fishmonger. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you have to talk and you have to get people to understand why it's so important, why you're doing what you're doing, you know, or we'll wind up back in the same boat again, you know? Uh, with no fish, no diversity, and, uh, you know, the funny thing about <clears throat> the 747 picture is you instantly recognized what it was. Nobody recognizes a functioning ecosystem, and I can guarantee you nobody recognizes one that isn't functioning, okay? The only way you recognize a functioning ecosystem is by watching these trophic cascades occur, things, you know, as big as the bald eagle, the ducks, the, you know, all the stuff that comes along with it. Um, it's much more complex. Uh, so we typically do a lot of public outreach. We'll talk to them, you know, the municipal will address everything and anything uh, in the effort to, you know, establish the run back. And in the future, if this proceeds forward, which I believe it will, you know, Camden could petition the state uh, for rights to the fishery and have a small LY fishery uh, on, on the on the on run, uh, much like Weber Pond does. And to give you an idea, Weber Pond, uh, the, the Vassalboro municipality, you know, takes in on average about eighteen thousand dollars a year from the uh, from the alewife fishery, uh, which is you know doesn't sound like a lot, uh, but it adds up and it adds up rapidly. Uh, Ten years, twenty years, you're looking at a brand new piece of fire apparatus, you know, or or whatever you choose to use it for, or more restoration work on both um, Gunter Cook Lake or or uh, the stream. Okay. Thanks, Nate. So we're at five thirty here. Um, I'm just going to acknowledge there are a few open comments. One that they used to catch suckers below the east and west dams at Molino Road. They somehow made it up past all of the lower dams fifty five years ago. And then um, we recorded this uh, research question as it relates to historical populations um, that Tony has, let's see, records that Seth, uh, the George's River Trout Unlimited group saying that there were records cited, he thinks um, of 10 species in the McGunt's cook, including, including sturgeon. 
and um, references from the Camden newspapers in the early 1800s, citing an effort to try to have alewives return to the river. And so that's something for the committee to follow up on. Yep. Um, thanks, Tony. Yep. So yeah, I think with that, we're at 531 and we're trying to keep these to schedule, but um, Nate, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to join us. And um, yeah, we, we might reach out with some follow-up questions, but um, thanks to everyone for, for being here at public and the committee and uh, we'll, we'll see you all next month. Thank you. Thank, thanks everybody. Thanks Have a, a great lot, evening. Thanks Nate.